Good morning, dear students. Glad to see you. I am going to deliver your lecture, Clinical Anatomy of the Face. Cellular spaces, blood supply, and innovation in particular. Facial spaces are potential spaces that exist between the fascia and underlying organs and other tissues. In health, these spaces do not exist. They are only created by pathology. For example, the spread of pus or cellulitis in an infection. The spaces filled with loose areolar connective tissue may also be termed clefts. Other contents, such as salivary glands, blood vessels, nerves and lymph nodes, are dependent upon the location of the space. Those containing neurovascular tissue, I mean nerves and blood vessels, may also be termed compartments. Generally, the spread of infection is determined by barriers such as muscle, bone and fascia. Pass moves by the path of least resistance. The fluid will more readily dissect apart loosely connected tissue planes, such as facial spaces, that erode through bone or muscles. In the head and neck, potential spaces are primarily defined by the complex attachment of muscles, especially milachioid, pusinata, masseta, medial pterygoid, superior constrictor and orbicularis soris. Infections involving facial, the head and neck may give varying signs and symptoms depending upon the spaces involved. Trismus, difficulty opening of the mouth, is a sign that the muscles of mastications are involved. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, and this noia, difficulty breathing, may be a sign that the airway is being compressed by the swelling. Classification One method distinguishes four anatomic groups. First one, the mandible and bellow, the buccal vestibule, the body of the mandible, the mental space, the submental space, the sublingual space, the submandibular space. Next, the cheek and lateral face, the buccal vestibule of the maxilla, the buccal space, the submasoteric space, the temporal space. The third, the pharyngeal and cervical areas, the pterygomandibular space, the parapharyngeal spaces, the cervical spaces. The mid face, the palate, the base of the upper lip, the canine spaces, infraorbital spaces, and the periorbital spaces. In oral and maxillofacial surgery, the facial spaces are almost always of relevance due to the spread of odontogenic infections. As such, the spaces can also be classified according to their relation to the upper and lower teeth and whether infection may directly spread into the space, primary space, or must spread via another space, secondary space. Primary maxillary spaces are canine space, buccal space, infratemporal space. Primarily mandibular spaces are submental space, buccal space, submandibular space, sublingual space, submasoteric space and cervical spaces also should be described independently of course. The mental space. It is a potential space bilaterally located in the chin between the mentalis muscle superiorly and the platysma muscle inferiorly. These spaces may be created by pathology, the spread of odontogenic infection, commonly the origin of the infection is an anterior mandibular tooth with associated 
periapical abscess which erodes through the buccal cortical plate of the mandibula at the level below the attachment of the mentalis muscle. Here you can see the mental space. The buccal space. It is a potential space in the cheek and is paired on each side. The buccal space is superficial to the postnatal muscle and deep to the platysma muscle and the skin. The buccal space is part of the subcutaneous space. Here you can see the buccal space. The boundaries of the buccal space. The angle of the mouth anteriorly, the masseter muscle posteriorly, the zygomatic process of the maxilla and the zygomaticus muscle superiorly, the depressor anguli oris muscle and the attachment of the deep fascia to the mandible inferiorly, the pusanita muscle medially, the platysma muscle subcutaneous tissue and skin laterally. The communications of the buccal space to the pterygomandibular space, infratemporal space, submasseteric space, or even the lateral pharyngeal space posteriorly. The infraorbital or canine space superiorly. And which is continuous from the head to the tool. Contents. Of the buccal space. The buccal fat pad, the parotid duct or stenon's duct according to the author, the anterior facial artery and vein, and the transverse facial artery and vein. Clinical significance of the buccal space. A hematoma may create the buccal space due to hemorrhage following wisdom teeth surgery. Buccal space abscess typically cause a facial swelling over the cheek that may extend from the zygomatic arch above to the inferior border of the mandible bellow and from the anterior border to the masseter muscle posteriorly to the angle of the mouth anteriorly. Unless another space is also involved, the tissues around the eye are not swollen. It is usually treated by surgical incision and drainage, and the incision is located inside the mouth to avoid the scar on the face. The incision are placed below the parotid papilla to avoid damage to the duct, and forceps are used to divide busanita and insert a surgical drain into the buccal space. The drain is kept in place for a variable period of time following the procedure. Long-standing buccal abscesses tend to spontaneously drain via acutaneous sinus at the inferior of the space, near the inferior body of the mandible and the angle of the mouth. An untreated cutaneous sinus can cause uh, disfiguring soft tissue fibros, fibrosis and the tract can become epithelial lined. Sometimes the buccal space is reported to be the most commonly involved facial space by dental abscesses. Also, other sources reports it is the submandibular space. Infections originating in either maxillary or mandibular teeth can spread into the buccal space, usually maxillary molars most commonly, and premolars or mandibular premolars. Odontogenic infections which erode through the buccal cortical plate of the mandible or maxilla will enter, either spread into the buccal vestibule, sulcus, and drain intraorally or into the buccal space, depending upon the level of the perforation in relation to the attachment of buccinita to the maxilla above and the mandible below. Frequently, infections spread in both directions as the buccinita is only a parietal barrier. Infections associated with mandibular teeth with apices at the level inferior to the attachment and maxillary teeth with apices at the level superior to the attachment are more likely to drain into the buccal space. 
Next space is the canine space. The canine space, also termed the infraorbital space, is located between the levator anguli oris muscle inferiorly and the levator labi superioris muscle superiorly. The term is derived from the fact that the space is in the region of the canine fossa and uh, that infections originating from the maxillary canine tooth may spread to involve the space. On this illustration you can see the canine space. Boundaries of this space are the nasal cartilages anteriorly, the buccal space posteriorly, the levator labi superioris superiorly, the oral mucosa of the maxillary labial sulcus inferiorly, and the deep border is created by the levator anguli oris muscle. Communications. The canine space communicates with the buccal space posteriorly. Contents. The angular artery and angular vein. The infraorbital nerve, a branch of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Clinical significance of the canine space. <clears throat> canine space infections may occur by spread of infection from the buccal space. Uh, signs and symptoms of the canine space abscess might include swelling that obliterates the nasolabial fold. If left uh, untreated, infections of the space will eventually spontaneously drain via the medial or lateral canthus of the eye, as this is their path of least resistance. Treatment is usually by surgical incision and drainage, and the incision is placed inside the mouth to avoid the facial scar. Rarely, when infections of the canine space erode into the infraorbital vein or the inferior ophthalmic vein via the synesis, they can be spread via the common ophthalmic vein through the superior orbital fissure and into the cavernous sinus. Uh, this can result in septic cavernous sinus thrombosis, which is a rare but life-threatening condition. Odontogenic infections may spread to involve the canine space. The most likely uh, causative tooth is the maxillary canine or maxillary first premolar. This occurs when pus from a parietal abscess perforates the buccal cortical plate of the maxilla above the level of attachment of the levator anguli oris muscle. This is more likely if the tooth root is long. The maxillary canine has the longest root of the teeth and its apex lies at the level above the muscle attachment. Then we should discuss the masticator space. Uh, this term is sometimes used and is a collective name for the submasoteric, trigomandibular, superficial temporal and deep temporal spaces. The infratemporal space is the inferior portion of the deep temporal space. The superficial temporal and deep temporal spaces are sometimes together called the temporal spaces. The masticator spaces are paired structures on either side of the head. The muscles of mastication are enclosed in a layer of fascia formed by cervical fascia ascending from the neck which divides at the inferior border of the mandible to envelop the area. Each masticator space also contains the sections of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and the internal maxilla, maxillary artery. The masticator space could therefore be described as a potential space with four separate compartments. Infections usually only occupy one of these compartments, but severe or long-standing infections can spread to involve the entire masticator space. The compartments of the masticator space are located on either side of the mandibular ramus and on either side of the temporalis muscle. On this picture you can see uh, the masticator space and its parts. Then the submasoteric space. It is a potential space in the face over the angle of the jaw and is paired on each side. It is located between the lateral aspect of the mandible and the medial aspect of the masseter muscle and its investing fissure. The term is derived from sub meaning under 
and Latin uh, in Latin and masseteric, which refers to the masseter muscle. The submasseteric space is one of the four compartments of the masticator space. Sometimes the submasseteric space is described as a series of spaces created because the masseter muscle has multiple incisions that cover most of the lateral surface of the mandible. Here you can see the submasseteric space. The boundaries of each submasseteric space are the anterior imaging of the masseter muscle anteriorly, the parotid gland posteriorly, the zygomatic arch superiorly, the inferior border of the mandible inferiorly, the lateral surface of the mandibular ramus medially, the submasseteric space is superficial to the mandible, the masseter muscle laterally, the submasseteric space is deep to the masseter. Then, the communication of each submasseteric space are to the buccal space anteriorly, to the pterygomandibular space around the posterior imaging of the mandibular ramus of its medial surface, and the parotid space posteriorly, to the superficial temporal space superiorly. In half, the space contains the masseteric artery and vein. Submasseteric abscesses are relatively rare and may be confused with the parotid abscess, um, abscesses of uh, parotid gland. They trend to be chronic. The submasseteric space may be involved by infections that spread from the buccal space. Sometimes, mandibular fractures in the region of the angle of the mandible may cause an infection of the submasseteric space. The sign is symptoms and symptoms of uh, a submasseteric abscess may include marked trismus, typically opening the mouth since the masseter elevates the mandible and it becomes restricted, and swelling in the region of the masseter muscle. The treatment of a submasseteric space infection is usually by surgical incision and drainage, and the incision is placed intraorally inside the mouth or both intra and extraorally if other parts of the masticator space are involved. The submasseteric space is sometimes involved by the spread of odontogenic infections, such as a pericoronal abscess associated with an impacted mandibular third molar, lower wisdom tooth. When the apices of the tooth lie very close to the within the space. The next one, the perigomandibular space. It is a potential space in the head and is paired on each side. It is located between the medial perigoid muscle and the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. The pterygomandibular space is one of the four compartments of the masticator space, of course. Uh, this uh, illustration demonstrates you the pterygomandibular space. The boundaries of which pterygomandibular space are the posterior border of the buccal space anteriorly, the parotid gland posteriorly, the lateral pterygoid muscle superiorly, the inferior body of the mandible lingual surface inferiorly, the medial pterygoid muscle medially, the space is superficial to the medial pterygoid, the ascending ramus of the mandible laterally, the space is deeper to the ramus of the mandible. The communications of each pterygomandibular space are to the buccal space anteriorly, to the lateral pharyngeal space and peritonsular space medially, around the medial pterygoid muscle, to the submasseteric space laterally, around the ramus of the mandible, to the parotid space posteriorly, to the deep temporal and infratemporal space superiorly. In health, the space contains the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, the inferior alveolar artery and vein, the phenomandibular ligament. 
Uh, the polygonal dibula space is the area where a local anesthetic solution is deposited during the inferior alveolar nerve block. A common procedure used to anesthetize the distribution of the inferior alveolar nerve. Rarely pathogenic microorganisms from the mouth may be seeded into the perigomandibular space during this injection and cause a needle tract infection of the space. It is also occasionally reported that the needle uh, breaks off and is retained in the pterygomandibular space during this injection. Minor oral surgery is then required to remove the fractured needle. Due to its high vascularity, infections into the pterygomandibular space carry a high risk of intravascular injection. Another possible complication of an inferior alveolar nerve block occurs when the needle is placed too deep. Passing through the pterygomandibular space and into the parotid gland behind. Branches of the facial nerve run through the substance of the parotid gland and so this is uh, manifest as a transient facial palsy. The pterygomandibular space is one of the possible spaces into which a tooth may be displaced into, uh, during dental extraction of the maxillary wisdom tooth. A mandibular fracture in the angle region may also be the cause of a pterygomandibular space infection. The sign and symptoms of an isolated pterygomandibular infection may include trismus. However, there is not usually any externally visible facial swelling. Intraorally, there may be swelling and erythema, redness, or the anterior tonsillar pila, the palatoglossal arch, and deviation of the uvula to the unaffected side. The airway may be compressed. Treatment is by surgical incision and drainage and the incision may be placed inside the mouth or two incisions may be used one inside the mouth and one outside. Odontogenic infections may spread to involve the pterygomandibular space, and the most common teeth responsible for these are the mandibular second and third molar teeth. The infratemporal space. It is a potential space in the side of the head and is paired on either side. It is located posterior to the maxilla between the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone medially and by the base of the skull superiorly. The term is derived from infra meaning bellow and temporal, which refers to the temporalis muscle. The infratemporal space is the inferior portion of the deep temporal space, which is one of the four compartments of the masticator space, along with uh, the pterygomandibular space, the submasseteric space, and the superficial temporal space. The deep temporal space is separated from the pterygomandibular space by the lateral pterygoid muscle inferiorly and from the superficial temporal space by the temporalis muscle laterally. The deep temporal space and the superficial temporal space together make up the temporal spaces. Here you can see the infratemporal space, its location. The infratemporal space has the following boundaries. They are the greater wing of the sphenoid bone superiorly, the pterygomandibular space inferiorly, the infratemporal surface of the maxilla anteriorly, the lateral pterygoid plate part of the lateral pterygoid muscle and lateral pharyngeal wall medially. And that's all. The communications of the infratemporal space are the pterygomandibular space inferiorly, the buccal space anteriorly and inferiorly, to the cavernous sinus via the pterygoid plexus of veins. The contents of the infratemporal space are branches of the maxillary artery, the pterygoid venous plexus. 
Infections of the intertemporal space are rare. They may be significant, however, as it is possible for infection to spread via emissary veins from the pterygoid plexus to the cavernosinus, which may result in cavernosinus thrombosis, a rare but life-threatening condition. The signs and symptoms of uh, an infratemporal space infection are swelling of the face in the region uh, of the sigmoid notch, swelling of the mouth in the region of the maxillary tuberosity and uh, marked trisma, typically opening of the mouth, since some of the muscles of mastications are restricted by the swelling. Treatment of the abscess of this space is usually by surgical incision and drainage with the incision being placed on the face, a small horizontal incision posterior to the junction of the temporal and frontal processes of the zygomatic bone, or both on the face and inside the mouth. The spread of odontogenic infections may sometimes involve the infratemporal space. The most likely causative tooth is the maxillary third molar, upper wisdom tooth. The deep temporal space. It is a potential space in the side of the head and is paired on either side. It is located deep to the temporalis muscle. The inferior portion of the deep temporal space is also termed the infratemporal space. The deep temporal space is one of the four compartments of the masticator space, along with the pterygomandibular space. The submasteric space and the superficial temporal space. The deep temporal space is separated from the pterygomandibular space by the lateral pterygoid muscle inferiorly, from the superficial temporal space by the temporalis muscle laterally. The deep temporal space and the superficial temporal space together make up the temporal spaces. The boundaries of the deep temporal space are superior superior and inferior temporalis lines, inferior infratemporal crest and zygomatic arch, the contents of the deep temporal space, temporalis muscle. Now we should discuss some facts about the vasculature of the face. On this table you can see main arteries and veins that supply the human face. Arteries. Mostly these are the branches of the external carotid artery. and veins are the tributary of the internal and external jugular veins. Green color shows you the way of the facial artery from the anterior edge of the masseter muscle to the medial angle of the eye. The facial artery is the fourth branch of the external carotid artery. It is a very totus artery and this serves a functional purpose. That means the artery can accommodate head movements as well as the pharyngeal expansion, as in swallowing and facial movements of the cheeks, lips and jaws. It arises above the ascending pharyngeal artery and passes diagonally up from underneath the styloid and the gastric muscles. The vessel arches over the submandibular gland in a groove on its posterior surface. From there, it arches superiorly over the mandibular body in close association with the lower part of the masseter. The vessel then 
travels anteriorly and superiorly across the buccal region to reach the angle of the mouth and then passes upwards along the side of the external nose and terminates as the angular artery near the medial commissure of the eye. Here, the angle artery. Uh, the angular artery is essentially a terminal branch of the facial artery. The facial artery, as we just know, the fourth branch of the external carotid artery. The branches of the vessel are closely attached to the angular head of the quadratus labi superioris, also known as elevator la labi superioris. The angular vein also accompanies the artery in this path. In the buccal region, this artery distributes small branches that go on to anastomose with the infraorbital artery. The artery then goes on to supply the orbicularis oris and the lacrimal sac and ultimately terminates in an anastomosis with the nasal branch of the ophthalmic artery. The facial artery gives off a branch known as an inferior labial artery, which supplies the lower lip. It branches off close to the angle of the mouth, and it travels superiorly and anteriorly underneath the triangularis muscle, also known as a depressor angle oris. It pierces the auricularis oris and continues its totos journey underneath the lower edge of the lower lip. It goes on to run beneath the mucous membrane and the aforementioned muscle. The vessel goes on to anastomose with the mental branch of the inferior alveolar artery. It then supplies the lower lip muscles and muscle mucous membrane. The superior labial artery is a branch of the facial artery that supplies the upper lip, nasal septum, and other of the nose. That vessel is larger and more totose than its inferior counterpart. It follows a similar course to the inferior artery by passing between the orbicularisoris and mucous membrane and journeys above the upper edge of the upper lip. The superior labial artery supplies the upper lip but also supplies the nose through a few branches. It also gives off a septal branch that can supply blood as far anteriorly as the nasal tip and also gives off an other branch that supplies the other of the external nose. On this picture, you can see Arteria labialis superior and Arteria labialis inferior that surround the lips from each side. Maxillary artery branches. The maxillary artery, the seventh branch of the external carotid, gives off an intraorbital artery. It also gives off the orbital branches and the anterior superior alveolar arteries. The orbital branches supply the rectus inferior, inferior oblique, and the lacrimal sac. The anterior superior alveolar arteries descend through the anterior alveolar canal to supply to the upper incisor canine teeth and then mucous membrane of the maxillary sinus. On this picture you can see the maxillary artery, its continuation, the infraorbital artery and its branches. The buccal artery is a small artery of the head and a branch of the second part of the maxillary artery and supplies both the bussinata muscle and cheek. The inferior alveolar artery is one of the five main branches of the maxillary artery. It supplies the tooth, 
sockets of the mandible. That vessel becomes the incisor branch to the incisor teeth, the mantle branch, which escapes via the mantle foramen, the milahioid branch, with its, uh, which is a branch of the inferior alveolar just before it enters the mandibular foramen. It supplies the milahioid muscle and runs in milahioid groove. Here you can see the maxillary artery. The submental artery is another branch of the facial artery, which is given off just prior to the facial artery entering the submandibular gland. It runs forward upon the milochioid, below the mandible, and beneath the digastric muscle. It supplies uh, the surrounding muscles. The supraorbital artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery that supplies the skin of the forehead, the scalp, the frontal sinus, upper eyelid, diploe, and levator palpebra superioris. The supratrochlear artery is the last branch of the ophthalmic artery. The terminal branches of the vessels anastomose with the infra and uh, with the supraorbital artery, of course. Look at this picture, and uh, you can see supraorbital artery and supratrochlear artery. Here is the facial artery. Uh, that uh, produces several branches for the lips and for the external nose. Uh, and here the term is uh, one of the terminal parts of the maxillary arteries is a mental artery for the chin. Uh, superficial temporal artery also takes place in vasculature of the face producing uh, arteria the branch that, that is called arteria transversa facie, it connects uh, the trunk of the superficial temporal artery with the facial artery. Uh, so, the facial artery and its branches, anastomosis, uh, anastomose, form anastomosis, in other words, with the branches of the maxillary artery and the terminal branch, branches of the uh, ophthalmic artery and as you know the maxillary artery the superficial temporal artery uh, the facial artery are the branches of the external carotid artery but the ophthalmic artery uh, that produces supraorbital and supratrochlear arteries uh, is the branch of the internal carotid artery posterior auricular artery the posterior auricular artery is the sixth branch of the external carotid and is a quite small. Uh, the landmarks uh, that it originates superior to are the stylohyoid and the digastric muscles. It generally emerges opposite the tip of the styloid process. The artery passes superiorly deep to the parotid gland and passes with the styloid process. It travels uh, farther between the mastoid process and the cartilage of the external ear. The artery supplies the scalp behind the ear and the ear itself. Uh, this picture also demonstrates uh, you the arteries of the face and some arteries of the scalp uh, compared with uh, the location or the locations of the veins. A uh, few words about uh, superficial temporal artery. As uh, we've discussed before, this is the uh, eighth and final branch of the external carotid artery and is certainly a large artery of the head. Uh, it is commonly used by um, anesthetists uh, who can uh, readily access its pulse in the temporal region above the zygomatic arch and above the tragus. The transverse facial artery is a branch of the superficial temporal artery, the terminal branch of the external carotid. As you know, it supplies the parotid gland, parotid duct and masseter muscles. 
uh, and as we've discussed yet, the um, transverse facial artery connects uh, the superficial temporal artery uh, with the facial artery. It plays the role of anastomosis. The middle temporal artery arises from the superficial temporal artery. It arises above the zygomatic arch and perforates the temporal fascia. Gives branches uh, to temporalis and anastomosis with the deep temporal branches of the internal maxillary artery. The zygomatic orbital artery is an occasional branch of the middle temporal artery. It runs along the upper body of the zygomatic arch between the two layers of the temporal fascia and may arise from the superficial temporal artery also. The vessel supplies the orbicularis oculi and anastomosis with the lacrimal and palpebral branches of the ophthalmic artery. The facial wing. Now uh, about uh, uh, some information about wings. The facial wing is a large vessel of the face and is much less totus than the artery of the same name. It lies posterior to the facial artery and begins from the lateral side of the nose. It drains the external palatine vein and will go on to join the retromandibular vein. And this then forms the common facial vein. The inferior labial vein drains the lower lip and the superior labial vein drains uh, the upper lip. Uh, the deep facial vein originates from the pterygoid venous plexus and is of considerable size. It communicates with the anterior facial vein. Facial vein is colored in green, and you can see uh, its tributaries. The supraorbital vein. The supraorbital vein begins its course on the forehead, and it communicates with the frontal branch of the superficial temporal vein. The vein passes inferiorly, superior to the frontalis muscle, and commonly joins the frontal vein and the medial angle of the orbital socket to form the angular vein. The supraorbital vein drains the forehead, eyebrow and upper eyelid. Supratrochlear vein is also known as the frontal vein. It originates in the forehead in the venous plexus and combines with some frontal branches of the superficial temporal vein. All of these veins will uh, converge onto a single trunk close to the midline which is usually parallel to the vein of the other side. The two trunks commonly combine via a transverse branch close to the root of the nose, referred to as the nasal arch. This arch usually receives some small branches of the nose. Rarely, uh, the paired supratrochlear veins combine to form a single trunk which drains the two angular veins at the nasal root. Then the superficial temporal wing uh, that begins its course in the lateral aspect of the skull in a venous plexus, which uh, the supraorbital wing and the frontal wing. It combines with uh, its patna wing on the opposite side and also combines with the occipital and auricular wing. Numerous veins drain into this plexus close to the zygomatic arch. This forms a trunk which combines with the middle temporal vein that exists from the temporalis muscle. Uh, this trunk will then go on uh, to enter the parotid gland and unify with the internal maxillary vein and create the posterior facial vein. Here you can see this vein. The transofacial vein begins its journey at the side of the skull in a venous plexus that also drains the supraorbital posterior auricula, occipital, frontal and opposite transverse facial vein. This network also drains the parietal and frontal branches which go on to unite superior to the zygomatic arch and eventually from the trunk of the combined veins. 
The middle temporal vein reveals itself from underneath the temporalis muscle and unites with it. The vein now traverses across the posterior root of the zygomatic arch and uh, subsequently enters the sub substance of the parotid gland. It will now meet with the internal maxillary vein to form the large posterior facial vein. The angular vein is a small vein near the eye and is formed by the combination of the frontal and supraorbital veins. From this location it passes inferiorly along with the root of the nose until it reaches the orbital socket. At that point it becomes the anterior facial vein. The vein receives blood from the nasal veins which run along the ala of the external nose and goes on to combine with the superior ophthalmic vein via the nasofrontal vein. It therefore establishes a, a crucial anastomosis between the cavernous sinus and the anterior facial vein. Posterior auricular vein uh, begins its journey on the side of the head and also communicates with the occipital and superficial temporal veins via a venous plexus. From there it goes on to pass downwards posterior to the ear and combines with the posterior division of the posterior facial vein. It now forms the external jugular vein. It also drains some veins from the external ear and the stylomastoid here is the superficial temporal vein. Then, the maxillary artery is one of uh, the two terminal division of the external carotid artery in the head. The second terminal branch is the superficial temporal artery, it's a fact. Therefore, the maxillary artery can be defined as one of the communications of the external carotid artery and distributes uh, the blood flow to the upper maxilla and lower mandible jaw bones, deep facial areas, cerebral dura mater and the nasal cavity. Hence, it is uh, considered a blood vessel with, which supports both hard and soft tissues in the maxilla facial region. This is the summary of uh, the blood supply of the face and the facts about the maxillary artery. So, the main trunk of the maxillary artery is divided into three parts, which are named according to related structures along the artery's course. These three parts are mandibular part, or the first part, named as such because it wings around the deep of the neck of the mandible. The second one, pterygoid part. It has this name because it travels between the two heads of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Pterygopalatine part, the third part, this part derived its name from the pterygopalatine fossa into which it enters. Conventionally, these three parts are described as the part before, part on and part beyond the lateral pterygoid muscle. This is also useful since out of the 15 branches of the maxillary artery, the five branches from the second part, part of the lateral pterygoid muscle, are regarded as branches to soft tissues and they do not course through the foramina in bones. However, the remaining 10 branches from the first and third parts go through foramina in bones. Uh, this table uh, shows you uh, the branches of the maxillary artery. Deep auricular artery, anterior tympanic artery, middle meningeal artery, inferior alveolar artery, accessory meningeal artery, masseteric artery, pterygoid artery, deep temporal artery, 
Bassanita artery, sphenopalatine artery, descending palatine artery, infraorbital artery, posterior superior alveolar artery, middle superior alveolar artery, pharyngeal artery, anterior superior alveolar artery, artery of the pterygoid canal. You had better to uh, make a conspect and to write down these facts. The way of the maxillary artery. The maxillary artery continues as one of the terminal divisions of the external carotid artery at the level of the neck of the mandible and passes forwards between the neck of the mandible and the sphenomandibular ligament. It continues its path by running deeply to the lower head and passes forward between the two heads of the lateral pterygoid muscle to break into its terminal branches and the pterygopalatine fossa. Mandibular part. Let's uh, divide all the branches of the maxillary artery into those three parts from the mandibular part, deep auricular artery. This branch runs upwards to enter the ear and causes superficially to the tympanic membrane, passing between the cartilage and bone to supply blood to external acoustic meatus of the ear. Then, middle meningeal artery. It passes uh, through the foramen spinosus and uh, supplies um, the meninges. This is uh, the biggest artery for the meninges. Anterior tympanic artery. This is the second branch that courses near the tympanic membrane. It passes deep to the membrane through the pterygotympanic fissure to the middle ear to join the circular anastomosis around the tympanic membrane. Next branch is the middle meningeal artery. This one passes straight upwards through the foramen spinosum to join one, two roots of the auricular temporal nerve. It supplies bones of the skull and the dura mater. Inferior alveolar artery runs downwards and forwards towards the inferior alveolar nerve to meet the nerve at the mandibular foramen. This artery runs further anteriorly in the mandible, supplying the pulps of the mandibular teeth. Uh, and the body of the mandible, of course. Its other branch, the mental branch, emerges from the mental foramen and supplies the nearby lip and skin. Accessory meningeal artery. This branch is the chief source of blood supply to the trigeminal ganglia. It passes upwards through the foramen ovale to supply the dura mater of the floor of the middle fossa and the trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave. Then the next part of the maxillary artery is the pterygoid part. All the branches from the pterygoid part supply only soft tissues, as we've just discussed. Masseteric artery accompanies the lingual nerve. It is small and passes laterally through the mandibular notch to the deep surface of the masseter muscle, which is it supplies. Pterygoid artery. This artery varies in its number according to Orders. However, it supplies the lateral pterygoid muscle and medial pterygoid muscle. Deep temporal artery. This branch bifurcates into two, anterior and posterior. They cause between the temporalis and uh, the pericranium, respectively, supplying the muscles and anastomos with the middle temporal artery. The anterior division communicates with the lacrimal artery by means of small branches, uh, which perforate the zygomatic bone and great mean of the sphenoid. Then the buccal or butsemeter artery runs obliquely forward between uh, the pterygoidus internus and insertion of the temporalis muscle to the 
outer surface of the bosonator muscle to which it supplies. It anastomoses with branches of the facial artery and with the infraorbital artery. From the infraorbital area, the buccal artery descends bilaterally in the superficial space along the lateral margin of the nose, then running uh, antiparallel to the facial artery across, across the lateral oral region. And at least the pterygopalatine part. Here we can meet the following branches. The sphenopalatine artery supplies the nasal cavity. It is also called nasopalatine artery. It passes through the sphenopalatine foramen into the cavity of the nose at the back part of the superior meatus. Here it gives off its posterior lateral nasal branches, crossing the inferior surface of the sphenoid. The sphenopalatine artery ends on the nasal septum as the posterior septal branches. A descendant palatine artery. Uh, this divides to form the greater and lesser palatine arteries to supply their hard palate and soft palate respectively. It descends uh, through the greater palatine canal with the greater and lesser palatine branches of the pterygopalatine ganglia. It emerges from the greater palatine foramen, runs forward in a groove of the medial side of the alveolar border of the hard palate to the incisive canal. The terminal branch of the artery passes upward through this canal to anastomose with the sphenopalatine artery. Infraorbital artery passes forwards through the inferior orbital fissure along the floor of the orbit and infraorbital canal to emerge with the intraorbital nerve of, on the face. Then, posterior superior alveolar artery supplies the maxillary teeth, gives branches that accompany the corresponding nerves through foramina in the posterior wall of the maxilla. Then, middle superior alveolar artery, branch of the infraorbital artery, Pharyngeal artery supplies structures such as the pharynx and uh, roof of the nose. Anterior superior alveolar artery branch, also the branch of the intraorbital artery. Artery of the pterygoid canal runs into the pterygoid canal. It passes backwards along the pterygoid canal with the corresponding nerve. It supplies the upper part of the pharynx and sends a small division into the tympanic cavity to anastomose with the tympanic arteries. The pterygopalatine fossa is an inverted pyramidal shaped fat filled space located on the lateral side of the skull between the infratemporal fossa and the nasopharynx. It is known as a major neurovascular crossroad between the orbit, the nasal cavity, the nasopharynx and the oral cavity, the infratemporal fossa and the cranial fossa. Given its uh, inherent complex location and connections, the pterygopalatine fossa can act as a natural conduit for the spread of inflammatory and neoplastic diseases in the head and neck. This picture illustrates you the pterygopalatine fossa. It can be described as a rim between uh, the tuber maxilla and uh, processus pterygoidus osseus etmoidale, sphenoidale, pardon, sphenoidale, of course, sphenoid bone. Skeletal framework. The walls of the pterygopalatine fossa are formed by three bones of the skull, the maxilla, the palatine, and the sphenoid. The anterior wall is formed by the posterior surface of the maxilla. The medial wall is formed by the lateral surface of the palatine. The roof and the posterior wall are formed by the sphenoid, uh, specifically the anterior superior surface of the pterygoid process.
The Telegapalatine fossa houses many important universal structures. Among these are the maxillary nerve, the Telegapalatine ganglion, the terminal part of the maxillary artery, wings as well as their associated branches. Maxillary nerve is uh, purely sensory. It originates at the second division of the trigeminal ganglion in the cranial cavity, travels through the foramen rotundum and enters uh, the pterygopalatine fossa. At the pterygopalatine fossa, the maxillary nerve gives rise to the zygomatic nerve, the posterior superior alveolar nerve, and two ganglionic branches, while its main trunk continues into the inferior orbital fissure as the intraorbital nerve. The ganglionic branches allow the maxillary nerve to communicate with the pterygopalatine ganglion, thus serving as a conduit for parasympathetic and sympathetic postganglionic fibers to travel through. Along with the sensory fibers of the maxillary nerve, these fibers, I mean sympathetic and parasympathetic, either leave directly from the pterygopalatine ganglion as orbital, palatine, nasal and pharyngeal branches or from the maxillary nerve along with its associated branches. Collectively, the branches of the maxillary nerve and the pterygopalatine ganglion supply the sphenoidal, ethmoidal and maxillary sinuses, nasal cavity, nasopharynx, uh, roof of the oral cavity, upper teeth and their associated structures, skin over the temple, uh, cheekbone, lower eyelid, lateral aspect of the nose, upper lip, the zygomatic nerve being one branch of particular importance carries parasympathetic postganglionic fibers from the pterygopalatine ganglion to supply the lacrimal gland. The pterygopalatine ganglion is the largest of the four parasympathetic ganglia located in the head. At the pterygopalatine fossa, it sits inferior to the maxillary nerve and anterior to the opening of the pterygoid canal. The pterygopalatine ganglion houses the cell bodies of the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons and receives parasympathetic preganglionic fibers and sympathetic postganglionic fibers from the nerve of the pterygoid canal. The nerve of the pterygoid canal is formed by the union of the greater petrosal nerve, branch of the facial nerve of course, and the deep petrosal nerve, a branch of the carotid plexus. It thus carries parasympathetic preganglionic fibers of the greater petrosal nerve and sympathetic postganglionic fibers of the deep petrosal nerve. Once formed, the nerve of the pterygoid canal leaves the middle uh, cranial fossa, travels through the pterygoid canal via the foramen lacerum, and enters the pterygopalatine fossa to join the pterygopalatine ganglion. Here is the way of the maxillary nerve and uh, its uh, branches. Know that only the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers of the nerve of the pterygoid canal synapse are the pterygopalatine ganglion, while the sympathetic postganglionic fibers travel through it. In addition, the maxillary nerve is purely sensory and thus has no autonomic function. However, it is um, used as a vehicle by parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers to reach their targets. Adapting a palatine for some. We can meet also the maxillary artery, and we've discussed it before. A few words about wings that accompany the arteries. Wings that drain the areas 
supplied by the branches of the terminal part of the maxillary artery. Travel with these branches back into the pterygopalatine fossa. Uh, they then continue through the pterygomaxillary fissure and join the pterygoid plexus in the infratemporal fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa serves as a gateway for seven openings that communicate with the orbit, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the middle cranial fossa, and the infratemporal fossa. These openings transmit branches of the maxillary nerve, the pterygopalatine ganglion, and the maxillary vessels. Uh, the seven openings are the pterygomaxillary fissure, the sura pterygomaxillaris, pterygomaxillary In, Latin, in English, fissura pterygomaxillaris in Latin. Foramen rotundum, pterygoid canal, palata vaginal canal, inferior orbital fissure, palatine canal, sphenopalatine foramen, and pterygomaxillary fissure. The pterygomaxillary fissure is located between the anterior and posterior wall of the pterygopalatine fossa. It communicates with the infratemporal fossa and transmits the posterior superior alveolar nerve and the maxillary artery. Foramen rotundum is located on the posterior wall of the pterygopalatine fossa. Superior to the pterygoid canal, it communicates with the middle cranial fossa and from there it transmits the maxillary nerve. Pterygoid canal is located on the posterior wall of the pterygopalatine fossa between the foramen rotundum and the palatine canal. It communicates with the middle cranial fossa and from there it transmits the nerve, artery and vein on the pterygoid canal. Palatovaginal canal is located on the posterior wall of the pterygopalatine fossa inferior to the pterygoid canal. It communicates with the nasal cavity and transmits the pharyngeal uh, branches of the maxillary nerve and artery. The inferior orbital fissure is located on the superior border of the pterygopalatine fossa. It communicates with the orbit and transmits the zygomatic nerve and the intraorbital artery and vein. The palatine canal is located inferiorly at the pterygopalatine fossa. It communicates with the oral cavity via the greater palatine and the laser palatine canals which transmit the greater palatine and lesser palatine nerves, respectively. The palatine canal also transmits the greater palatine artery. The sphenopalatine foramen is located on the medial border of the pterygopalatine fossa. It communicates with the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and transmits nasal nerves and the sphenopalatine artery. Uh, as about clinical aspects, because of its location and associated connections, the pterygopalatine fossa is often involved in the spread of tumors, infections and inflammations caused by neoplastic diseases in the head and neck, uh, such as juvenile uh, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, bacterial sinusitis, sinusitis and uh, so on. For instance, in uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angular fibroma, the tumor extends into the pterygopalatine fossa via the sphenopalatine foramen and spreads in a uh, multidirectional fashion into other regions of the head, such as the sinuses, the infratemporal fossa, the orbit, and the cranial fossa. The principal regulator of the sensory uh, modalities of the head is the trigeminal nerve. This is the fifth uh, of uh, 12 pairs of cranial nerves that are responsible for transmitting numerous motor sensory and an autonomous stimuli to structures of the head and neck. While uh, the trigeminal nerve is largely a sensory nerve, it also uh, mingles in the uh, realm of motor supply. Unlike the other cranial nerves, the trigeminal nerve is quite large. It has four nuclei that send uh, fibers uh, to from its tracts and is associated with three separate branches. 
Uh, on this table, you can um, see the description of the trigeminal nerve, its nuclei, its divisions. I suppose uh, you all know those divisions uh, very well, and uh, the maxillary nerve we've just discussed. And functions of this nerve is also known. As the name suggests, uh, the trigeminal nerve is a, a triparate entity made up of distinct terminal divisions. Each component of the nerve is responsible for a specific region of the face and transmits specific impulses. The three divisions of the trigeminal nerve are ophthalmic division, first one, maxillary division, second one, and mandibular division, the third one. This is the topography of the ophthalmic nerve. It reaches uh, the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, and here it uh, produces three main branches nervus frontalis, ner nervus lacrimalis, nervus nasa ciliaris. Uh, the ophthalmic branch is the first division of the trigeminal nerve. It is a purely sensory nerve that carries afferent stimuli of pain, light, touch and temperature from the upper eyelids and supraorbital region of the face up to the vertex of the head. The nerve also acts as a conduit for sympathetic fibers that require access to the ciliary body, lacrimal glands, cornea and conjunctiva of the eye. Uh, furthermore, the ophthalmic branch uh, also carries fibers arising from the dura mater of the anterior cranial fossa, the frontal sinus, and the superior aspect of the nasal cavity. The ophthalmic division also has several tributaries um, that constitute it. The three main nerves that come together from uh, the ophthalmic nerve are the nasociliary, frontal, and lacrimal nerves. Uh, the acronym NFL is also useful to recall these three branches. Uh, the nerves unite within the superior orbital fissure to form the ophthalmic division. Once formed, the ophthalmic nerve also receives its meningeal tributary from the dura of the anterior cranial fossa. Uh, on this table you can see uh, three branches of the ophthalmic nerve and uh, the area and the structures they supply. Additional sympathetic branches from the cavernous sinus also join the ophthalmic nerve as well. Uh, the ophthalmic nerve travels in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, below uh, the trochlear nerve and above uh, the maxillary nerve. It continues posteriorly and emerges from the cavernous sinus in Meckel's cave, where it pierces the meninges uh, to enter the concave surface of the trigeminal ganglion. The branches of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve uh, were summarized at the previous table. Like the ophthalmic branch, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve is a purely sensory uh, entity that carries impulses from the mid-face. Uh, it has a middle meningeal branch that detects stimuli from the dura of the middle uh, cranial fossa. Additionally, the zygomatic, pterygopalatine and posterior superior alveolar nerves unite at the opening of the foramen rotundum to form the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, here you can see uh, the branches of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Middle meningeal nerve, zygomatic nerve, pterygopalatine nerves, branches of the nasal cap for the nasal cavity, palatine nerves, posterior superior, superior alveolar nerves, infraorbital nerves. Of course, uh, stomatologists are uh, mostly are interested in um, posterior superior alveolar nerves. Uh, at this nerve, uh, as this nerve enters the cranial vault, it passes in the lateral wall of the cavernal sinus below the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. It uh, maintains a posterior course until it pierces the meninges and joins the trigeminal ganglion within Meckel's cave.
for a short course this nerve is sandwiched between the uh, first division superiorly and the third division inferiorly. The last of the three to geminal branches is the mandibular division. As the largest component of the trigeminal nerve, it carries both sensory and motor stimuli. The motor branches correspond to the muscles that originated from the first pharyngeal arch. The sensory branches supply the lower third of the face, excluding the angle of the mandible. Uh, the angle of the mandible is supplied by the second and third cervical segments. Although it carries sensory modalities from the mouth and gingiva, it doesn't carry special efferent stimuli, I mean taste. However, the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandible nerve, acts as a conduit for the horde tympani, which carries taste stimuli. Horde tympani is uh, the branch of the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, of course. The motor components of the mandibular nerve travel as a single slender nerve uh, fiber alongside the larger sensory fibers. Together they travel through the external opening of the foramen ovale and travel towards Meckel's cave. The nerve receives the recurrent meningual nerve that carries afferent stimuli from the dura prior to uh, penetrating the trigeminal ganglion. intracranial course of different portions of the trigeminal nerve. The three branches of the trigeminal nerve unite within a shallow depression on the posterior medial side of uh, the middle cranial fossa known as a Meckel's cave. In this fossa, the nerves unite to form the semilunar gasserian or trigeminal ganglia. Medial to these structures uh, is the superior petrosal sinus which may be superiorly or inferiorly related to the opening of the Meckel's cave. The clevus, basal avenous plexus, ventral aspect of the pons and brainstem are also medially related to the cave. Laterally, the medial aspect of the temporal lobe is immediately adjacent to the Meckel's cave. As the fibers of the trigeminal nerve leave the trigeminal ganglion, they travel superamedially toward the pons. Here, both sensory and motor divisions of the nerve pierce the lateral surface of the pons near the superior pontine sulcus. Once inside the pons, half of the sensory fibers will divide into ascending and descending groups. The ascending groups will move towards the uh, mesencephalic nucleus, while the descending groups will join the spinal to germinal nucleus. Uh, the remaining sensory fibers will travel uh, dorsomedially toward the main sensory nucleus, while the motor fibers will take similar course to reach the motor nucleus. So, parasympathetic associations. While the trigeminal nerve does not have parasympathetic innate parasympathetic fibers, it is associated with several parasympathetic ganglia along its course. These ganglia are ciliary ganglia, ganglion ciliare. The ciliary, uh, ciliary ganglion is formed by presynaptic fibers arising from the Edinger westphal nucleus. The fibers are associated with the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The post Synaptic fibers uh, leaving the ciliary ganglion supply the ciliary and sphincter pupillae muscles via the short ciliary nerve. The otoganglion, next one, receives parasympathetic input from the inferior salivatory nucleus via the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is the ninth cranial nerve. The fibers are associated with the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The postganglionic fibers go to supply the parotid gland via the auricular temporal nerve. Like the otic ganglion, the submandibular ganglion is also associated with the mandible nerve. The preganglionic fibers arise from the superior salivatory nucleus and travel through the nervous intermedius branch of the facial nerve. The fibers eventually join the horde tympani, therefore entering the lingual nerve. The submandibular and sublingual glands eventually receive postganglionic fibers arising from this ganglion. 
Finally, the uh, pterygopalatine or sphenopalatine ganglion is associated with the maxillary nerve. The parasympathetic fibers travel within the greater petrosal nerve, which is a branch of the uh, facial nerve. The lacrimal gland, as well as the palatal and nasal mucous glands, are subsequently innervated by the postsynaptic fibers of the ganglion. Clinical examination. Since the trigeminal nerve supplies motor and carries sensory stimuli, clinical examination of these nerves should evaluate the integrity of these uh, modalities with regards to these stimuli. However, based on the uh, territory supplied by the trigeminal nerve, it is also possible to test its uh, integrity by evaluating the corneal and jaw jerk reflexes. Recall that prior to every clinical examinations, the clinical should obtain informed consent from the patient. This is done by explaining the steps involved in the test, the expected results and what they would suggest and where to go from there. Uh, this should be done using non-medical uh, jargon to ensure that the patient understands uh, exactly what will be done and what the expected outcome will be. A sensory examination. The sensory uh, modalities being uh, tested are pain, reception and light touch. Temperature is not usually checked during the clinical exams. For light touch, show the patients the wisp of cotton that will be used to touch their face. Uh, this may help to elevate any unwarranted unnexity about the exam. Then, touch the patient with the cotton wisp on the exposed area of skin and same manner you would um, during the evaluation. This is used as uh, reference points assuming that uh, there are no sensory defects in that area for the patient to compare the outer stimuli to. The patient is given clear instructions to close the eyes for the duration of this part of the exam and say yes every time they feel a touch. Uh, proceed to examine each to general division by lightly tapping the cotton wisp on the territory supplied by each branch of the trigeminal nerve, avoid applying too much pressure as the patients may uh, to spread the pressure sensation for the light touch. Always uh, compare left to right in order to determine uh, whether a unilateral or bilateral uh, deficit exists. The same steps are then Repeat it using the neuro tip to access the superficial pain. Record uh, the findings and interpret any deficits found. Uh, another part of the sensory test that is not uh, frequently performed is the nasal tickle test. It includes gently gliding a cotton whisk inside each nostril. The sensation is rather unpleasant and the patient uh, readily recognized it. It would be wise for the clinician not to stand directly in front of the patients while performing this test as they may burst into a fit of sneezing, which is a normal physiological response. So, uh, there are uh, other tests that uh, you can use. For example, the corneal reflex, the jaw jack reflex, the motor examination. You can see the description of those tests uh, on this slide. You can write the principal movements if you are interested in. And uh, maybe uh, sometimes you will use it in your clinical practice. So, summary. Of course, my dear friends, uh, this information is too big and uh, rather difficult.
but it's uh, very important uh, to learn it carefully because uh, the area you will work with it's not so simple and uh, to perform proper manipulations operations uh, you should have an excellent knowledge the summary above the trigeminal nerve if this is a mixed a cranial nerve that has both sensory and motor functions. There are three divisions of the trigeminal nerve of tonic division, maxillary division, mandibular division. There are four nuclei associated with the trigeminal nerve main sensory nucleus, mesencephalic nucleus, spinal trigeminal nucleus, motor nucleus. Uh, the intracranial course of the trigeminal nerve is as follows. Both sensory and motor fibers emerge from the superior pontine sulcus. The sensory fibers from synapse at the mm, semilunar gasserian or the geminal ganglion in Meckel's cave. The three divisions emerge from the sensory ganglion. Uh, the first division and the second enters the cavernous sinus, while the third, along with the motor division, leave the skull through foramen ovale. Uh, the first division enters the skull through the superior orbital fissure, uh, while the second enters the skull uh, through foramen rotundum. There are four parasympathetic ganglia that are anatomically associated with the trigeminal nerve. These are the otic ganglia, uh, pterygopalatine or sphenopalatine ganglia, ciliary ganglia and submandibular ganglia. Uh, the innovation of blood supply of the maxillary and mandibular teeth are dependent on the blood vessels and nerves that supply the upper and lower jaws. As the maxilla is deemed part of the mid face and the mandible part of the lower face respectively, it is logical to assume that they have separate neurovasculature. While it is true that uh, within the alveolar bone, the maxillary and mandibular nerves and vessels mirror one another. There are anatomical differences with extra branches and adjacent structures such as the mental foramen of a mandible or the greater palatine foramen of the heart palate. Uh, here you can see the key facts about the neurovascular supply of the teeth. Uh, please, if it's possible, uh, write down or make a screenshot of this picture because uh, this information is related with your daily practice. The maxillary nerve, which is the second division of the trigeminal nerve, carries sensory fibers teeth to the maxillary dental arch. It runs laterally to the cavernal sinus and exists, exits the skull via the foramen rotundum in the middle cranial fossa, leading into the pterygopalatine fossa. Here it divides into four major branches, which are the posterior, superior, alveolar nerve, the infraorbital nerve, the zygomatic nerve and the ganglionic branches of the pterygoid plexus. The intraorbital nerve gives uh, of two branches which contribute to the superior dental plexus. These are the anterior superior alveolar nerve and the middle superior alveolar nerve. The other branches of the maxillary nerve are the ganglionic branches, the posterior superior alveolar nerve and the zygomatic nerve. The intraorbital nerve forms a plexus with the posterior superior alveolar nerve, which is known as the superior dental plexus. Uh, you um, can see the animation of the maxilla on this picture. The posterior superior alveolar turns laterally into the pterygomaxillary fissure and into the infratemporal fossa. It descends via the infratemporal surface of the maxilla to form the posterior portion of the superior dental plexus and innervates the posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus as well as the maxillary molars. 
The middle superior alveolar nerve varies upon its path and as it descends to the uh, form the middle portion of the superior dental plexus, it innervates the medial and lateral aspects of the maxillary sinus and the premolars. It may in some cases also innervate the me mesiobuccal root of the first molar, if it is not covered by the posterior superior alveolar nerve. Lastly, the anterior superior alveolar nerve descends uh, to form the anterior portion of the superior dental plexus. It enervates the in anterior aspect of the maxillary sinus as well as the incisors and the canines. Before uh, we continue, a few additional words must be said about the infraorbital nerve. It uh, continues from the pterygia palatine fossa through the inferior orbital fissure and into the orbit. It leaves the orbit via the inferior orbital groove and the inferior infraorbital canal anteriorly and finally emerges on the face via the infraorbital foramen. Here it divides into three branches, which are the nasal, the inferior palpebral and the superior labial. These branches supply the outer cartilage of the nose, the dermis of the lower eyelid and the upper lip respectively. Innovation of the mandibular teeth. The mandibular teeth are primarily supplied by the inferior alveolar nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve. The mandibular nerve carries fibers that are both sensory and motoric due to the measure of its large sensory and small motor roots just after it exits the skull via the foramen ovale. It enters the infratemporal fossa and immediately gives rise to a meningual branch, a superior and inferior division. The anterior division is smaller and motoric, save the buccal branch with a remain sensory. The other branches include the mesoteric nerve, uh, the anterior and posterior deep temporal nerves, the medial pterygoid nerve, the lateral pterygoid nerve. The posterior division is the larger of the two and has the exact opposite ratio of motoric and sensory branches that, uh, than the anterior division. The single motoric branch is that of the milohyoid nerve, whereas the sensory branches are the auricular temporal nerve, the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve. The inferior alveolar nerve is the largest of the mandibular branches and it descends to the lateral pterygoid muscle before running between the sphenal mandibular ligament and the ramus of the mandible and finally entering the mandibular foramen and running through it to the level of the second premolar, where just like the inferior alveolar artery, it terminates on the corresponding mental and incisive nerves. It innervates all of the mandibular teeth, the periodontal ligaments and the gingiva from the premolars anteriorly to the midline. The mental nerve supplies the chin, the lower lip, the facial gingiva and the mucosa from the second premolar anteriorly. The incisive nerve supplies the teeth and the periodontal ligaments from the first premolar anteriorly. Blood supply and venous drainage of the mandibular, mandibular teeth in particular. The maxillary artery gives rise to a single branch to supply the mandibular teeth, which is known as the inferior alveolar artery. It descends inferiorly along with the inferior alveolar nerve and enters the bone via the mandibular foramen. At the level of the second premolar, it terminates uh, into the branches of the mental and incisive arteries after it has supplied all of the mandibular teeth. The mental and incisive arteries supply the labial gingiva of the anterior teeth and uh, the anterior teeth themselves respectively. The inferior alveolar vein is the sole collector of the blood pumped around the mandible and it drains into the pterygoid venous plexus. When a tooth undergoes trauma such as uh, being knocked during a fall or a sports tournament, uh, several degrees of injury may occur from a simple uh, concussion to a fracture. 
and all the way up to a subluxation or even avulsion. Any of these injuries may cause trauma to the apex of the tooth, where the neurovascular neurovasculature enters. And when it happens, the tooth may likely die. As a result, the tooth becomes discolored and looks gray. On an X-ray, the pulp cavity can be seen to calcify, and when this happens, a root canal is needed to prevent internal resorption. If the tooth is still sound with the alveolar bone, a simple veneer or a crown after a successful root canal treatment will restore the dentition. Uh, so, my dear friends, I'd like to express best wishes for the uh, sources uh, we used to create this lecture. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I advise you to listen to this lecture very carefully. Even though it's rather difficult to understand, you should try to do it, because it is intimately related with your future work. And this lecture, uh, not this lecture in particular, but the information about the face, uh, different structures of the face, its vasculature, its, an, its innovation, and especially about the cellular spaces, this information is of great importance. Thank you. See you next time. My best wishes. Goodbye.